you everyone um, for joining today's webinar. I will turn it over to Bill Heaven. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. This is uh, HBK's uh, first monthly risk advisory webinar of 2022. Um, as Michelle said, my name is Bill Heaven. I'm a senior director here at HBK in our risk advisory service practice. And uh, this afternoon, we have a very interesting talk, topic of um, vulnerability management that we're going to um, talk about. Um, advance the slide, and we'll go through some logistics here. Okay, so just a few housekeeping issues. Here's our, on the screen here is our agenda that we're gonna run through. Today's presentation is eligible for one hour of CPE credit. In order to obtain your CPE credit, you'll need to remain on the webinar for the entire session and answer four content sensitive questions that are gonna pop up throughout the webinar. And then the, the fourth question is actually um, you answer yes or no to whether you want to receive CPE for um, today's webinar. Now we've muted all the incoming lines, but we are monitoring the message center. So if you have anything you want to bring to our attention, just uh, send us a chat through the chat window. And we're going to try to leave some time at the end for the presentation to handle any questions. But if you have questions during the uh, webinar, just um, Feel free, feel free to put those in the chat window and uh, send those to our attention. We'll queue those up for the end. And um, we have made a copy of today's presentation available in PDF form uh, that you can download and, and relook at it at your leisure, as well as today's webinar is being recorded and we will make links to that recording available after the, uh, the session. Uh, next slide. So as part of the CPE, we have um, five learning objectives that we've sent out ahead of time with our registration invite, which are those are um, shown on the screen here. So that's, um, there's no uh, prerequisites for the course, but these five learning objectives we plan on covering today. Um, next slide. And this is, uh, this is my mugshot here. I've been with HBK since 2018. I have uh, a dual responsibility role here at HBK. I do uh, internal facing um, IT security and governance, as well as um, work with clients on an external facing role as well. And um, next slide. Today I'm joined by um, Damon Hacker, who is the president and CEO of Vestige um, Digital Investigations. Um, Damon is a uh, just in my opinion, it's really awesome speaker on cybersecurity. I'm always really pleased when I can uh, um, get enough time on his schedule to have him have him present. This is the uh, second time he's uh, presenting for HBK. So, um, Damon, I'll just turn it over to you, and you can uh, add anything else on your bio, and then um, jump into our presentation today. All right, sounds great. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be back. Uh, as Bill said, my name is Damon Hacker. Couldn't have picked a better name for myself if I had tried, given what uh, what I do in life. Uh, I guess it was preordained that uh, that's what I would end up uh, doing. So uh, anyhow, yeah, not much else on, uh, there other than I've been around for uh, quite a while time in the uh, IT and uh, specifically in the cybersecurity world uh, from there. So, all right, so yeah, today we're gonna talk about um, uh, vulnerability management. Uh, and in order to set the stage, I kind of wanted to give you two quick case studies. Um, and uh, one of them is what we call the Hafnium Exchange Vulnerability. And uh, you may may have seen this or read about it in the newspapers uh, last year. It's actually uh, happened in uh, early 2021, not, not quite a year ago. And uh, it affected a lot of companies, um, pretty drastic in the sense of this affected what we refer to as on-prem, on-premises exchange services, right? So this is Microsoft Exchange, the email, and um, specifically only for ones where companies were housing it themselves. So this didn't affect Office 365, um, the cloud version, or a lot of the other providers that offer cloud, but not necessarily Office 365 per particular. Um, some of the worst things that it did is that it actually allowed access to email accounts 
without even being authenticated into them. Um, so, you know, people were receiving emails from, uh, you know, spam emails from somebody that, uh, you know, they were expecting, but it wasn't them that was actually sending it out. And some of the companies, some of the attackers were using it simply to get in and read the emails and learn more about what was going on so that they could launch other kinds of attacks like business email compromises, which we talked about the last time I had spoken here, um, install malware or other kind of viruses in there. And a fair number of the attackers actually used backdoors uh, or they, they installed backdoors that allowed them to have access into that server for quite some time. The name Hafnium is actually a Chinese uh, hacking group, um, and uh, was uh, you know a lot of the uh, you know techniques and uh, you know proce procedures that they used basically pointed back to that, and we were able to attribute this to that uh, particular group. In particular, this attack exploited four vulnerabilities, and we'll talk about these at the bottom of the page a little bit later in terms of what those are, but there were four vulnerabilities that when chained together allowed these individuals to be able to get into these systems without authentication from there. Now, I mentioned, I'm going to work backwards on this timeline, the blue that's down at the bottom, March 2nd, 21, that's when we all became aware of it, right? Um, however, if we look, the actual vulnerability that led to the exploit was discovered almost three months prior to that. So December 10th of 2020, shortly thereafter by the same group, a company called DevCore had actually discovered it and actually about 20 days later discovered a second vulnerability within the exchange uh, server that allowed them uh, to do this. So they kind of put together a proof of concept. Around January 5th, they informed Microsoft of it. Microsoft got in uh, on, on it and started putting together a, uh, a patch for it. Um, but it was about a month after that, that Microsoft then was informed that we had started seeing attacks on uh, the servers in the wild. Yet it wasn't for another month before um, the, you know, the rest of the world kind of came uh, aware of it. Um, in that interim time, Microsoft was working on this patch. They notify DevCore on February 27th. And interestingly enough, three hacker groups picked this up. I'm not sure how that happened yet, uh, but three uh, hacking groups picked that up and started actively exploiting those, uh, those things. March 2nd really was, you know, it kind of hit uh, full steam. I'll tell you just from our experience, we actually had, and I just looked this up, uh, our first case came in on March 4th. So two days after that, our first case that we examined uh, was two days after that. We uh, and were involved with uh, new new clients, nine new clients during that time frame. We did assessments uh, or you know forensic analysis on it uh, with the last one. Well, the last one during that time frame coming in um, uh, as late as um, April 30th. And then we full, go full steam on this and uh, we actually had uh, one in November where it hadn't been patched yet and somebody else was still vulnerable um, for that uh, from there. That's gonna be a pattern that we're gonna talk about a little bit as we go through there. But just to put things in perspective, um, this was believed to affect about 125,000 servers around the world um, from there. And that was just that particular set of uh, vulnerabilities and exploits. Shortly thereafter, there were three other attacks that basically leveraged some of those same vulnerabilities. Our evil Black Kingdom ransomware um, used one of the uh, one of the vulnerabilities, proxy logon, and uh, the Prometai uh, botnet. And I'm sure there was more uh, from there, but that's what we knew about um, in from there. So uh, to say that it's a, a big deal, um, you know, is uh, is probably an understatement uh, from there. So um, actually, this is just a repeat of the of the learning objectives that are there. So I'm going to skip that one real quick. So, all right. So we titled this one Log4j. And the reason we did that was because if you've watched, if you've picked up any newspapers, read anything, gotten emails and that kind of stuff, you may have seen Log4j or the actual exploit Log4shell because it just happened, right? Um, and so this is a, a, a good example um, it was a good example to, to use because it's very current, right? So it was what we refer to as a zero day, a zero day exploit. And the whole concept of a zero day 
is that it is something that, that, so we talk about vulnerabilities and exploits, right? So a vulnerability is a weakness, okay? Just because something is, uh, is a weakness doesn't mean that it's gonna be exploited, right? It's the exploit that becomes the important part of this. And when we talk about zero day exploits, that means that the exploit becomes available before the vulnerability is even known or at least widely known. And to put that in perspective, let me jump back to April of 20 or of 2003, I believe. Um, and the world was kind of hit with something called the NIMDA virus. That's admin spelled backwards, NIMDA virus hit. Um, actually, it didn't hit until November of that year, but when they started looking at the vulnerability that led to that, that vulnerability was discovered and patched by Microsoft in April of that year. And yet here we were eight months later and it hit and there were millions of companies that were around the world that were affected by that. We call that the dwell time. And the problem is that today, the dwell time has significantly diminished. We don't get the pleasure of having eight months most of the time. We don't like to see zero days, of course, because that means that it's happening even before we've had a chance to patch it uh, from there. But anyhow, with Log4J or Log4Shell specifically, it was discovered on December 9th of last year. And what it basically allowed was something called remote code execution or RCE attacks. And what that is, is it means that somebody sitting in some other location can uh, execute arbitrary code on your server or your system to carry out something that they want to do. Now, the problem with Log4Shell and the uh, Log4J is that Log4J is everywhere. And I'm gonna give you some background on what it is. So it's a Java application. It's, a, it's what we call a library. And if you kind of look at the way that software is put together these days, a lot of software is no longer bespoke programming, meaning somebody sitting down and programming the entire thing. A lot of times what happens now is your development team develops what they need to to provide unique functionality, but then they assemble the software based upon all kinds of other libraries that other people have written. And Log4J is an example of that. It is a logging utility. It allows companies, it allows people who are developing in Java to log anything, right? I mean, if we wanna log errors in our program to a database or to a, a file, we can use Log4J, we can simply include it and um, we don't have to go back and rewrite the entire functionality. It's a very powerful library. You can do nearly anything that you would ever conceive that you need to do from a logging standpoint. So errors, um, uh, you know, anything really. The problem with that is, is, and this is, like I said, no means this is a complete list, but this is just a list of some of the companies that were affected by Log4J and uh, Log4Shell exploit. If you look at this, it's a veritable like smorgasbord of all kinds of security companies, right? I mean, we've got Amazon Web Services, Atlassian, which is used by a lot of developers. You've got communication companies like Broadcom and even Semantic Endpoint Protection Manager, which is part of that. We've got Cisco, cPanel, which a lot of companies use for their, web their website administration. We've got flavors of operating systems like Debian and Ubuntu and that. We've got uh, FortiGuard, which is a, uh, a, a firewall company. I mean, in the list, is actually Gidra, I thought that was a really interesting one. That's the NSA's uh, um, uh, reverse engineering uh, tool uh, from there. The problem is, is this, this particular uh, library has been embedded in all kinds of applications. And even if you don't embed it, you probably have in your environment some software that relies on other software that has it embedded in uh, from there. So just to kind of put things in perspective, it affects thousands of applications, a staggering amount of companies that have been affected. Days after Log4Shell became known, 
it was seen that nearly 50% of all of the corporate networks in the world have been already targeted by this, by people trying to see if, they were, if the um, servers were vulnerable to it. It is literally hundreds of millions of devices that are at risk, not the least of which are even some of the IoT um, you know, devices in people's homes and in the offices and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, IoT, the insecurity of things, no, the internet of things, right? And we're seeing using this um, uh, exploit to be able to add things like even something like crypto mining malware or some pen tests and hacker uh, software called Cobalt Strike, ransomware, using it to you know steal uh, you know credentials and that kind of stuff. It is a huge, huge impact that has happened um, out there. That I will pause for a moment. All right. And I don't know if I have to yeah. do something to get Michelle, that. Michelle, just I think um, I think Michelle will tell us, Damon, when um, when it looks like the poll questions have been addressed for CPE. Perfect. Michelle, when you when it looks good, just go ahead and uh, give Damon back control so he can uh, keep going here. All right. Looks like. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So. What I want to do is I want to leave you. I want to I want to kind of educate you in terms of like how these attacks actually happen, right? And so there's quite a few ways that um, you might become a target of uh, these attacks, um, and, uh, and and I'm going to show how these vulnerabilities play into that, right? So crime of opportunity, right? I want you to think about this. Is let's say that you drive into your neighborhood tonight. And not one, not two, not five, but 50 burglars are going up and down the road, rattling the windows, shaking the doors, trying to see if they can get in, right? We would never stand for that if this was in the physical realm. But the reality of it is on the internet, that is exactly what happens 24-7, 365. There are people who are testing the, you know, the external just to see if there is a vulnerability that they can get into. Again, that you know, perfect example of that was with the log for shell that within weeks we saw you know 50% of the corporate you know, uh, uh, networks attacked this way. And they're just looking to see if they can get in, right? You might become a victim because of collateral damage from someone else's system getting compromised, right? So I've had this happen several times where maybe you have a trusted connection with an outside company, whether it's a client, a vendor, um, you know, some uh, maybe even your IT company. Actually, we're looking at one right now um, where I think the IT company was the entree into the environment, right? So their their system got compromised. They use it as a backdoor into uh, somebody else's. Uh, from there. Uh, you could happen because of you know somebody else's email getting compromised. So that's why things were so ugly with the Hafnium um, uh, one was because uh, here now you're getting emails from people who you'd expect to get emails from, but they were not legitimate. Uh, from there. And then credentials being lost, employee owner, something like that is you know so collateral damage that way. You might be part of an unlucky targeted group, right? Uh, you know, whatever the uh, group du jour is um, on it. So uh, professional services, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, you get a manufacturer and whatever. And the reason that is, is because what works one time tends to work multiple times. And so we see, oftentimes we see a rash of um, items, uh, you know, attacks going on in a particular industry, and then they move on to the next industry. The takeaway on that one is, listen to your peers, join peer groups, know what's going on. If you start seeing that others in your peer group are starting to receive you know, attacks and that kind of stuff, it's time to start paying attention because what works somewhere is likely gonna work in your uh, environment as well. Right from there. Now, there are times when you may be purposefully targeted, right? Um, sometimes that's for no other reason than you were a previous victim, right? So if you've had a BEC attack, um, if you've had ransomware in the past, um, they sell that information, right? There's a whole black market um, uh, for that kind of information. And you will find that oftentimes if you've had a, an attack, you'll continue to suffer it. And that's the reason why uh, from there. Uh, but uh, yeah, you might be purposely targeted from there. The big thing you need to understand 
is that, and this is a complicated chart initially, but here's the here's what I want you to take away from it. It used to be over here on the left hand side that there were a lot of people out there that were attacking, but they weren't very sophisticated, right? We call them script kitties. They'd pick something up off the internet about some novel way of being able to get into an environment. That's all about they like, it was about all they could do. They really couldn't pull off any kind of sophisticated attack. And then you had hackers. I, I tend to actually call them crackers, right? Hackers do some good things too. Uh, maybe I'm a little sensitive to that. Um, but realistically, the kind of things that we read about and hear about a lot, they are the more of these advanced persistent threats, these really, really advanced attacks, generally state-sponsored. Think about Korea, North Korea, China, Russia, those are the kinds of things we hear about. Well, the problem is, is that today there are tools available to even the script kiddies that allow them to rise to the same level that an APT or a state-sponsored uh, attack is. There's an actually, you know, so you're probably familiar with the term SaaS, right? Software as a service or PaaS, platform as a service, IaaS, infrastructure as a service. We're putting all kinds of things out there in the cloud and making them just, you know, for hire, right? As, you know, a monthly fee or something. Well, guess what? There's ransomware as a service. There's malware as a service. There's hacking as a service as well. And as a result of that, this red line, you know, is taking people who don't really have that much skill, they can basically purchase that for relatively affordable amounts and carry off some very sophisticated attacks. And that's what we're seeing. And that's why, you know, um, you know it's really important to make sure that we're being vigilant and staying, uh, staying up on those things. In order to I kind of understand the life cycle of an attack, um, I'm going to go through this. So um, this has you know, played out pretty well over the years that generally, if this is a targeted attack, there will be some kind of intelligence gathering, right? It may just be, you know, those taps on your door looking to see if anybody's home. It might be information that they pull off of your website, your social media sites, that kind of stuff. But there's going to be some kind of background research. Now, I will also tell you, a lot of this is purely just opportunistic. And so this step might be completely skipped just on the basis that they're just throwing out a bunch of stuff, you know, and seeing, you know, throwing it on the proverbial wall and seeing what sticks, right? But at some point in time, what's gonna happen is there's an, an initial attack. And if that attack is successful, right? They find some kind of vulnerability that they can exploit and they can get into the environment. The very first thing that's going to happen is they establish a foothold and they're going to want to enable persistence, right? So that we can get back in, right? And there's all kinds of different ways that that can be done. They can add an account, they can add some kind of Trojan, a back door. Um, they may just, uh, you know, compromise the credentials and never really say anything, um, you know, do anything. They're just fishing around um, from there. But once they get into the environment, then they're going to conduct what we call reconnaissance, enterprise reconnaissance, right? They're in there and they're just looking around and seeing what's in there. Now, one of the important things to think about or know about this is, is that oftentimes we see this happen very slowly, all right? They actually, a lot of these attackers treat this like a business and treat it as a portfolio. They may have 10, 100, thousands of companies that they are in the process of advancing this life cycle. And each day they visit it and they just do a little bit, right? They run this little search and they look around the environment to see what's going on, right? They do that so they can fly under the radar. Eventually what's gonna happen is they're gonna have a pretty good idea of what's in the environment. And they're gonna be looking to do a couple of different things. One of which is to move laterally within that. So let's say they've got one computer that had one vulnerability that they were able to exploit and get into the environment. They start looking around, they start discover, discovering other systems that are there. And one of the things they're gonna to try to do is laterally move to that new system. 
because if they can do that, then now they have a bigger surface of attack and maybe that system has access to things that the system that they initially um, uh, broke into doesn't have access to. Of course, the granddaddy of it, of course, is to be able to escalate privileges and either create administrator accounts in the system or escalate an existing account to that. But at some point in time, they're gonna to try to get that. And then at some point in time, is when all hell breaks loose. And they either gather up and exfiltrate the data that they're looking for, or they install malware, ransomware, or something along lines, uh, along that lines, all right? Okay, so that's kind of the chain, the kill chain for that um, from there. There's a lot going on in this slide. I'm gonna zoom in on here, because what I really want you to focus on is in the, kind of the middle left-hand side. Seven and a half months, is the average time that an attacker is inside the organization before the organization finds that out. And I'll also tell you the vast majority of that time, of the vast majority of those times, it's not discovered by the entity itself. It's usually discovered by somebody else, a customer, a vendor, an employee, something like that because of something that has happened um, external to it uh, from there. Seven and a half months is a long time to be in the environment. And what do you think they're doing during that time? Well, they're enumerating and identifying those vulnerabilities, right? They're trying to figure out, is there anything in here that would allow me to create an account on the in the environment or to escalate my privileges there? Are there things that would allow me to do remote code execution like the log for shell? Are there things where there's outdated unpatched software and other applications that might be, uh, you know, that I might be able to take advantage of? And the big one at the bottom is misconfigurations, right? You ask your IT people to do something, they do it, they think it's working, but reality, it's been misconfigured. Maybe it's not as tight as you thought it was, and that allows somebody to be able to, you know, to take advantage of that um, from there. So all that time, seven and a half months, and you know, it could be shorter than that, it could be longer than that, but the point of it is, is very rarely are they in the environment and as soon as they get in, are they doing something? Now, ransomware is kind of changing that horizon a little bit, and we are finding that you know, pretty quickly once they get in, that's what they're doing, because if they can lock everything down, now they've got you, uh, you know, from there. But uh, in general, there's gonna be some time that happens from there. And so the, so the question always is, is well, well, what do we do about that? And quite simply, the answer is beat them to it, right? We need a program. We need the ability to identify those vulnerabilities before an attacker gets into the environment. All right? And that's what I'm going to leave you with is kind of how do we do that within this organization, you know, within there. Hey, Damon, one, I know we're going to be switching to a poll question. So you can go ahead and um, put that up, uh, Michelle. But question because the uh, log4j seems to be very similar to the um, solar winds where it seems like the, the hackers are going after like a, almost a third party to get their their um, exploit into that you know someone else's code to be distributed down the supply chain yeah is, right. is that the trend that people are going um, well, yes and no. So, you know, the thing about it is, is that, you know, attackers are pretty crafty, right? Um, and so it, we're always staying, we're, you know, our goal is we always try to stay ahead of them, right? And that's the problem is, is that, you know, for every uh, advancement, you know, the good guys make, the bad guys are, you know, up in their game and that kind of stuff as well. That idea of supply chain uh, attacks is not a new idea. I mean, if you go back, actually, I think it was like in 2003 timeframe, um, RSA, right? RSA is the one that does a lot of the two-factor authentication. They have the certificates. They, you know, they were used by the financial industry uh, pretty, uh, pretty early on with things like two-factor authentication and, and encryption certificates and all that kind of stuff. Um, the attackers actually had figured out at one point in time, well, wh why do we have to keep doing this to all of the their clients? Why don't we just infiltrate RSA? And uh, you know, put in a false certificate so that that happens, and, and that you know, that was I don't know, I mean, nearly 20 years ago. So the idea mm -hmm. of solar winds, that same kind of thing, that's not uncommon. Yes, it makes a lot of sense because if we can compromise those, then it, it then it it's ubiquitous, right? I actually put log for shell in a little bit of a different 
um, uh, a different uh, category, um, only from the standpoint that this wasn't, or it doesn't appear that it was a deliberate attempt by a, an attacking group to put that into log4j. It's more of the fact that they discovered that that was a vulnerability, and it was because of the fact that log4j was so ubiquitous that it's affected so many people. But here is a big lesson to learn from that, right? right. Is That's interesting. Your developers need to be aware of that kind of stuff. We can't just blindly accept that these things are, you know, are, are good products to be able to bring into, into our environments, um, into our development environments, especially when they are open source, right? Because open source, anybody can add stuff to it. And, you know, it really does need to go through a, you know, a vigorous uh, review to make sure that there aren't these, you know, backdoors and that kind of stuff in it. And that's generally above and beyond what most you know, the skill level and, and even the philosophy of what most uh, developers um, have in there. Um, you know, actually, I would contend that your development team and your developers are actually probably the worst people to test the invite to test things. And the reason is, is that as they're developing things and, and you, you'll, you'll understand this, right? You ask somebody, you know, to develop a piece of software for you and you get the interface and you start playing with it and you're like, oh, what were you thinking here? they have their own idea of like what it should look like and they expect things to work the way that they've designed it to do so they don't think about the fact they're like well what happens if somebody puts in in the case of log for shell puts in a malformed you know message uh what do you do you know uh, this is a huge problem with web development web app development where companies go ahead and put in, uh, you know, the developer is expecting somebody to put in their first name. Well, they don't think about, well, what happens if they put in a bunch of numbers and symbols? Does it throw the, you know, the, the programming off or does it not um, you know, from there? And so that's kind of the idea with log for shells It was just a, you know, something different that was not expected to be put in there. And when that happened, it wrote, you know, to a specific file, you could, and then executed it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, somebody, you know, kind of figured out the, uh, the way to, um, you know, way to exploit that. So, that's, yeah, that's very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what do we do about that, right? So vulnerability management, right? It all comes down to that. At its core, we need a succinct process or a system, right, to do that. And so when we talk about vulnerability management, we say that it is a security practice, right? A practice is something you do all the time that's designed to beat them to the punch, right? To proactively prevent that exploitation of vulnerabilities. And for us, you know, when we look at it, the goal of that really should be to identify in the organization what the assets are and what vulnerabilities affect those, to be able to classify them so that we know, um, you know in some fashion, you know, we, we, we can talk about them and say, this is what these things generally do and how severe are they and that kind of stuff. It's important to understand how severe they are in your particular environment. We'll talk about that when I talk about data dumps here in just a minute, um, you know, on that one. And then, of course, it, we want to mitigate those uh, those problems, right? Either you know, put something in place of it so that it doesn't even you know, it's not affected, um, or remediate and fix those vulnerabilities. Problem is, is that there's a lot of companies that don't follow something uh, along those lines. A good vulnerability management program will promote consistent processes over all kinds of different threats, right? I think too often times companies fall into the pattern of, oh, well, we run a vulnerability scan or we have our annual penetration test, um, you know, something along that lines. And um, that's great. Uh, that may, you know, I, I would argue the frequency of that's probably not, you know, accurate enough or, or not quick enough uh, from there. But I would also say that it that only generally focuses on one particular type of threat. And uh, we need to expand that uh, from there. Um, a good vulnerability management program should align with the risk appetite of the organization, right? Each organization has different tolerance levels of risk. And not only different tolerance levels of risk, 
but different tolerances within different areas of the business, right? So you might be very risky when it comes to um, you know, mergers and acquisitions because, you know, you've done it so many times and you've got the ability to basically, you know, uh, you know, turn gold in, uh, you know, turn, turn straw into gold. Um, but you might have a completely different risk appetite when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, unfortunately, I usually find it the other way around, which is, you know, they're, they're pretty, uh, uh, adverse to risk in, in other areas of their uh, business, but because of the, lack of visibility, I guess I would say, or maybe kind of this idea that everything's kind of ethereal, a lot of times, or, you know, it's, it's hard to touch. It's hard to touch, you know, IT in general. It's even worse when you think about um, cybersecurity, that a lot of times it truly becomes one of those things where, you know, they don't know what they don't know. And if they don't recognize and understand that it's a, you know, that it is a risk, then it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, and I don't have to really worry about it. You know, going back to my example of going down the street, Right. You know, if we saw 50 burglars going down our street, we wouldn't stand for it. How many of you have looked at your firewall logs and seen that you're getting, you know, 100, you know, uh, connections every, you know, 15 minutes? You know, if you really saw that and looked at it and you know, reported on it, you'd probably be like, oh, my God, we've got to be more careful about this stuff. But again, it's out of sight, out of mind uh, from there. Um, a good vulnerability management means to be uh, easy to understand and easy to conduct uh, so that you do it frequently, right? I mean, that's and that's why I say things like, you know, an annual penetration test, while that's good and it measures a certain kind of um, you know, risk, uh, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's not frequent enough um, on that one. And then I like ones where we're giving the decision makers that visibility into it. And I'll talk about a, a way we can do that from here. So there's a couple of options when it comes to vulnerability management, right? I mean, we can do vulnerability scanning, right? And, and I'm gonna take a second and veer away from uh, this for just a second to just explain the difference between vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. And I know, you know Bill and you and I talked about this a little bit um, on that. Um, I would say that, I mean, first off, there is a difference. The problem is, is that most of the time, um, people kind of confuse the two, uh, two things uh, from there. So, uh, a vulnerability scan is not a penetration test. Vulnerability scanning is simply identifying the vulnerabilities that exist in the environment. Penetration test uses vulnerability scanning as a part of it, as a tool to identify those vulnerabilities, but it goes the next step, which is, are there exploits available to do it and can we actually exploit it? Because in your environment, just because you have a vulnerability, doesn't necessarily mean that it's exploitable. And it might not be exploitable because an ex exploit doesn't exist yet for it. It might not be exploitable because you have other compensating controls, other things that are in the way of that. And that's a good thing. So vulnerability scanning does not equal pen testing. The end result of it is probably the same, which is to identify those things, but it's done in a, you know, kind of a different way. Think of vulnerability scanning as a tool from there. Another way that we can, uh, you know, manage our vulnerabilities is to perform a formal risk analysis, risk assessment. Most of the time we talk about, you know, doing that with a framework. There's all kinds of different frameworks out there for doing that. Um, just three of them, I gave you an example, Octave Cobit and the NIST Risk Management Guide. Um, you know, they basically are the same, you know, they get to them in a little bit different ways. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a formal process that, uh, that you go through, um, you know, on that one. For me, I always say the best of this is a combination of these things. And unfortunately, what we generally find is, is that most organizations, if they're conducting any kind of vulnerability management, they're usually not combining the two. It's either that they're running vulnerability scans, maybe not even all that frequently, or they're performing a risk assessment once in a great while. Um, you really need to combine the two things uh, from there. So, all right. So, if you were to build a, vul a vulnerability management program, <clears throat> one of the first things I recommend is that we do perform one of those formal risk assessments. And I'm gonna take you through a couple of slides and that kind of stuff using um, NIST 800-30. So NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, you know, these are the people that uh, define the uh, uh, synchronous, um, uh, the atomic clock, so that we all uh, know what uh, what time it is. Uh, they define the standards in terms of weights and measures and all that kind of stuff. It's part of the government, um, but they also do a tremendous amount in the IT world and specifically in the cybersecurity world. 
So the NIST 800 series, there's a whole bunch of them there, but NIST 830, a great document to find, uh, especially if you've got uh, insomnia, you can just read that and it'll put you right to sleep. Uh, but it goes in and talks about how to conduct a formal risk assessment um, from there. Um, so uh, a couple of different things to point out on that one is, you know, generally, you know, what kind of assessment is this? Is this a baseline or an initial assessment, or is it an assessment that follows it up? Is it a quarterly, you know, um, assessment, an annual assessment that, you know, is building upon what we've learned the last time? Uh, generally, there's a couple of different ways of determining what the, or you're looking at the source of those threats. Uh, it could be that we want to look at a whole bunch of different vulnerabilities and then measure how our uh, how our environment uh, racks up against that. Or maybe we want to take an asset-based approach. We want to look at all the assets in ours and then just come up with, well, what is the potential for uh, you know a vulnerability at this particular with this particular asset? And and that's a little bit different because we're going to then prioritize things based upon the value of that asset. We also want to address scope. Right? Are we going to do this over the whole the whole operation, or are we going to define it more narrowly to something? And my recommendation is that you do all these. Right? So maybe the first time you're going to do an initial assessment, maybe you do it based on the vulnerability threats, and you scope it across the entire operation so that you get a good picture as to what are the organization's risks as it you know comes to cybersecurity. But maybe three months, six months later, you do a subsequent one. And this time we're gonna still do it based upon vulnerabilities, but instead of focusing on the whole company, maybe during the course of our initial assessment, we learned about some other uh, risks and maybe we're gonna narrow down on that. The last decision you usually have to make is, is this gonna be an objective or a subjective scoring on it? And what I mean by that is that, and I know this is a little hard to see, but basically what we're going to be doing for a risk assessment is we're going to be measuring the likelihood that something occurs and the impact if that were to occur, right? So we can objectively just kind of take a look at something and go, oh, yeah, it's a high risk or no, that's a low risk or it's a very low risk or something along that lines, right? Uh, and that would be kind of subjective. Objective would be more like assigning some kind of score to it, maybe even coming up with some criteria. And that's kind of what you see right here. So I've got this one measuring likelihood, you know, very high comes with it, a value of a 10. And it means that the threat is almost certain to occur or it occurs more than a hundred times a year. And so let me give you an example of that, right? The likelihood that you are going to receive a spam message is very high, right? Now, the impact of that might not be that bad, right? The impact of it could be that you've got, you know, compensating controls and that kind of stuff in place. You've got filters, things are getting, you know, that the user never opens the message directly because it's sandboxed and all that kind of stuff. And so even though the likelihood of that is a 10, maybe the impact of that is a low. It's a two where the effects are kind of limited, right? So I tend to like ones that are a little bit more objective because we're assigning a value to them. We've defined what that criteria is, and we're able to then take those two pieces, the likelihood and the impact, put those into a chart like what you see on the right hand side here. And now all of a sudden, if that and this one happens to be a threat based assessment where we have a list of maybe 150 potential threats where we go through it with the IT and the business people and we ask for each one of those threats. What's the likelihood that this could occur? And we kind of come to consensus on it. We agree, okay, great. Now what's the impact of that? And as we look at the impact, great, now we understand that. Now we can prioritize it. And the reason this is so important is so oftentimes when people start approaching their cybersecurity, they're doing it because they've been told, hey, we need to address this, but they don't necessarily know where to start. And that becomes the problem. They start doing it with a shotgun approach. Doing this provides you with a picture of where you need to start and what the priorities ought to be. And that's why I like starting with a formal risk assessment like that. Then, once we have that, then we start switching to more of a technical. 
in this chart, you know, we just, you know, if you look at all the vulnerabilities, the technical vulnerabilities that are out there, 81% of them fall at the network side of things with 19% of them being in the applications that you're running within your environment. Well, that's a lot of things to look at. And to do that manually and looking for all these misconfigurations and outdated software and has this been patched and all that kind of stuff, you're not gonna be able to do it. And so that's where vulnerability scans come into place. A vulnerability scan is, you know, it's an automated process. It's a test that you run across the entire environment or whatever the scope of the environment is. And it literally runs dozens, scores, hundreds, thousands of tests against each one of those devices based upon what the device is. They're generally smart, right? If I um, you know, if I go through and identify that this system over here is a Macintosh, well, I'm only gonna run the vulnerabilities and the exploits against that that are you know, uh, you know, applicable to uh, a Mac, uh, you know, a Mac en entity. If it's a server, there's going to be different things that I run versus a workstation, that kind of stuff. And the good news is you don't have to make that decision. The tool does that through itself. Now, I mentioned earlier that vulnerability scanning does not actually exploit it, right? So it doesn't go through the process of exploiting it like what a pen test would do. There. One of the caveats, one of the cautions that I have with running vulnerability scannings is data dumps. When you run this tool the very first time, you will be astonished at the number of things it finds in your environment, and you will be scared, and you'll be looking at this and going, oh my God, I had no idea we were this bad. And that might be the case, you might be that bad, but more likely, there's a lot of things that it found that are duplicative across the environment um, from there. So a uh, vulnerability scan is not someone attacking your network, right? That would be a penetration testing. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, because of the fact that it doesn't test the exploitation, it doesn't necessarily point out whether somebody can actually use that to get into the environment or not. By the way, I generally recommend that a vulnerability scan is run against the exterior of your uh, environment, right? So the, the perimeter of your internet connection. Most companies have a primary IP address that they've been assigned and all of the traffic goes in and out of that, but they may have a block of IP addresses. A typical company, you know, if you're just buying, buying like a business, uh, you know, class type of uh, service from your ISP, you're probably gonna get a block of eight IP addresses of which five of them are usable. You may only be using one of them. I would still scan all of your, the entire block to make sure that um, there's not something sitting out there that you didn't know about. But it is not good enough to only run a vulnerability scan from the outside. You must then run the vulnerability scan on the inside of the environment as well to identify all those locations where um, there's, um, um, where you've got uh, those vulnerabilities, okay? Bunch of different kinds of tools. I don't really care on any of them. These are you know, just some ones that are out there. I will uh, make note that OpenVAS and White Source are both open source versions of that. The rest of these are all commercial versions. The big thing I wanna make sure is that they are a tool and in and of themselves, they are not a vulnerability management program. A program involves actually handling the vulnerabilities, right? Um, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to get a deluge of those things when you, we want to prioritize those. The good news is, is almost all of these do use some of the common uh, scoring methodologies, whether that's CVSS, CVE, a lot of them use CVE, the common vulnerabilities and exposures. It's just a way of classifying them and then somebody else out there has actually classified it as to, is this a very high, high, moderate, low, or low, you know, very low uh, weakness um, on there, uh, from there. Caveat there is, is that is somebody who's classifying that based upon if this thing were present, is it bad for you if it's on the outside of the environment. Again, you might have compensating controls in place um, that, uh, that prevent that from actually being exploited. Second thing I mentioned, you're gonna get a lot of results back from this. One of the first things that we do if we're looking at these things is we're gonna really try to drive to the core problem. I'll give you a good example. Uh, a lot of times when I go into an environment, I run uh, a, a vulnerability scan, I will get about five or six different things that come up 
that are all related to your encryption, your SSL, TLS type of stuff. Um, you get five or six of these different things and you get the same problem over a whole host of systems. Well, it's one core problem. And the core problem is, is you're using an outdated TLS certificate and you're doing that across the entire environment. And so let's just say for argument's sakes, you've got 12 servers, all 12 servers have the same problem and there's six things that are all there. All of a sudden you're looking at 72 different problems and they all stack up and you look at it and go, oh my God, I've got so much problem. And really the answer is you've got one problem. It just happens to be, you know, being demonstrated six ways over 12 different servers. Let's fix the problem. Let's get it down to its core. And that can easily reduce the workflow, uh, workload many, many times. So just be aware of that data dump that these tools tend to provide uh, from there. And then the last piece of this, right? So you've done the, you know, that, you're, you're gonna do these things. We now, now have a list of all the things that need to be mitigated. You gotta put those somewhere whether that's a separate punch list that the IT is gonna work through, whether you put those in as service tickets in the help desk so that somebody's looking at them and, and, and measuring them, uh, not measuring them and, and getting them done, that's important part. And this is one of those things that I see a lot of people fail on. They run the thing, they get overwhelmed by what it comes back you know, with, and they decide, well, I'll, I'll just kind of start working on some of these things, but there's no real list and there's no real accountability for making sure those all get done. And so, you know, we know that what gets measured gets done. I strongly suggest putting this in some kind of KPI report, a security dashboard, something along that lines, so that management has a, a access to it and can see where we're at and are we making progress on uh, patching these things. Um, uh, putting them on a risk register is a good uh, thing and keeping that risk register up to date all the time as in it's a uh, working document. Um, on that one. So I'll pause there for another checkpoint. So I'll go ahead and, and we're advance that one where when we when it's been enough people have responded. All right. Okay. All right. So kind basically of, we'll kind wrap up, Dan. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So kind of wrapping that up, you know, we want to talk about this log for show a little bit more. And so let's use this as an example of like what you would do um or what you should have done to already identify it, right? So given the fact that this thing is everywhere. Right, and it's in commercial products that you may have employed in your environment. It may be in if you've done any development or had anybody come in and do some stuff. Maybe there, it may be in IoT devices, at your server. Your thing. It it is a real problem, and you need to start identifying it. Right. So the first thing really to do is to run some kind of automated tool like the um, like the vulnerability scanning and let it go through and discover everything that's in the environment and determine if this thing is there, right? So the whole idea of these vulnerability scanning things is, is that they, just like antivirus software, they generally pull down the definitions of the vulnerabilities that come, you know, come about each week. So for example, we happen to be, we use Qualys, uh, it happens to be one. And again, that's not a, um, um, an endorsement of it, it just happens to be the one we use. Um, I get a list every Sunday night of all the vulnerabilities that have been discovered and added to that tool. Um, and it's generally several hundred different vulnerabilities. Now, the vast majority of those vulnerabilities don't actually apply to us. They just happen to be that they were discovered and we've got to make that decision you know, there. So by running it, and understanding, you know, this thing's gonna go through your environment, look for those and point out all the places where you might have log for J in your environment. And then you start having to make some decisions. Do we turn that off? Do we isolate it? Do we patch it? Whatever it is, you need to have an inventory of all that so that then, and put somebody responsible for going through it and making that decision and actually uh, updating it. The good news is, is that most of the vendors that have been affected by it have actually come out with a patch for it. 
and have made it relatively easy to patch it. And then once it's patched, you know, you move on, you go to the next one. And once you've got them all done, you run that scan again and see if there's any that are still left in there. So with that, I'm gonna stop for a minute. Um, I think we've got one more poll question and I think we are opening it up. I think we got some questions. One more, yeah, you're right. Go ahead, Michelle, push that uh, last question up. Again, this is the one where, this is the toughest CP question out of the whole batch. So, um, probably don't need to leave that one up too long. And then Michelle, you now we got about four, four minutes left or so. So after you put the question or done with the question, let us know if there's any questions from the audience for myself or Damon. Yes, we did just get a question that was submitted. What is the most common oversight that you see companies make regarding vulnerability management programs? Damon, you want to take that one? I'm sorry? Do you want to take that question among the most common oversight? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, the most common one that I see from there is the fact that people don't run it frequently enough, right? So they maybe run it once a year, once a quarter, and right, I said every week, guy yeah, received, you know, 200, you know, things. So they're not running it on a regular basis, but more importantly, they're not doing anything with it. I cannot tell you the number of times that I go in and I'm like, what, why is this same, you know, let's say they do it on a monthly basis. And I look month after month after month after month and the same vulnerabilities keep coming up. Like, why have you not passed this? Why have you not taken care of it uh, from there? And again, they're just inviting it. Once somebody gets into the environment, the bad guy's gonna find that and they're gonna use it to exploit and uh, wreak havoc in the environment. Great. All right, that's uh, good. And Michelle, any other questions? I know we just have a couple minutes left. I we have got another one that was submitted. Uh, what are your thoughts on implementing an open source free wave vulnerability scanning tool? Open source, yeah. Um, so here's my general take on open source in general, right? Um, I think it has a place. Uh, some organizations may find it to be uh, too risky um, you know, from there. Um, I always like to remind people that open source is free only if you don't value your time, right? Because you're going to spend a lot of time troubleshooting it, setting it up and that kind of stuff, not necessarily with um, as much support as you might have uh, from a commercial product. Having said that, free is good, right? So um, for the right organization, I think that uh, certainly uh, makes some sense um, on that one. Uh, having said that, here's two caveats that I put um, uh, on that is one, when we are gonna use something that's open source, I make sure that it is the community version of a commercial product, right? So open vase, I mentioned that one uh, as a potential one there. That's a good example of what I'm talking about. Open vase has a whole bunch of commercial products there, but they have a community version that's free. It has some limitations. Eventually you're probably gonna to get to a place where you might outgrow it or decide that it doesn't fit the bill. Particularly with that one, what their community one does is they only update their definitions once a month. So you could be out of, uh, you, you may not see one of those vulnerabilities that are now coming out because the dwell time has become you know, so reduced. So, that, so just a consideration, uh, I've got plenty of clients that use it and it, it works very well. Um, and they've decided that that's a risk that they're willing to take. Um, the second thing that I look for is, is that if I don't find one that's a community version of a commercial product, then is it really, really well supported? Is there a huge following behind it and it has enough of a, a support community that it's going to be continued to be advanced and there's a lot of places you can go to get the support on it? Great, great. That's uh, good, uh, good advice there, Damon. Well, that, uh, we're up right on time for 1 o'clock, so I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today, and especially Damon for uh, taking time out of his busy schedule to, to talk with us. I always enjoy listening to him speak because I always learn something every time I, I sit in on one of, his, um, one of his webinars or presentations. So, Damon, thank you very much. And then for the rest of the audience, uh, we'll be sending out the uh, links to the recording, so if you want to re-listen to it or pass it on to a colleague. And then uh, to the save the date, our February webinar will be on Wednesday, the 23rd of February. So um, thanks again. Happy New Year and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.
Perfect. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Thanks.